if you have your Bibles, can you turn with me to the book of Mark? The book of Mark, uh, the fourth chapter. Um, honestly, I, I was going to teach tonight from the thought, kingdom synergy, stewarding your moments. <laughs> And uh, I ask God because I don't want to ever assume and, pre and be presumptuous as to what it is that he wants me to speak, especially if it's something that I've already done before. And, you know, it's very comfortable to preach or to teach something that you've already taught before. Uh, but each time I went to it, it didn't speak back to me. That's how I know when God is telling me what to speak. It did speak back to me. It just, it just, it just laid there. And what was percolating in my head and percolating in my heart is storms. It just kept on storms, 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 storms. And without knowing all of the conditions that's happening around this country and those who have been impacted by storms, those are natural storms. But just like there are natural storms that people are being impacted by, there are spiritual storms that people are in right now. And I believe that God wants to give us some understanding as to those particular storms. The book of Mark, the fourth chapter, uh, I, I'm going to back into the text. Uh, I am a conceptual thinker, uh, which means that I just don't think a text uh, in a vacuum. I look at the pretext, I look at the post-text, I look at everything that is happening, and I conceptualize thoughts concerning it. And then as I read it, stuff starts jumping off the page to me. <laughs> and there are things that's jumped up off the page even about this text. And we're going to read all the way uh, down to the end. We're going to start at verse 9. Uh, you, you have already heard uh, Dr. Oscar Williams talk about the seed and the sower. That was last Wednesday, right? Last Wednesday. Come on, let's praise God for Dr. Oscar. That was an amazing word. And to all of our pastors who are here, Pastor Don Johnson, God bless you. Good to see you. Pastor Robinson, good to see you. Dr. Crumpton's good to see you. Glad that you are here. Uh, all of the elders and ministers that are here, all of the, all of the deacons and, and diaconate, God bless you. Come on, let's praise God for all of the leaders that are here. Praise team, God bless you. Thank you so much. Musicians, we appreciate you guys and your work of service and your labor of love. Uh, there is something that, that as I was reading and tracking along, there's something uh, that jumped off the page, and I, I want to lift it up off the page for you too uh, before we dive into what God has given to me to give to you. Now, I'm going to do commentary while I'm reading because I'm trying to frame this for you. Uh, uh, the book of Mark, the fourth chapter, verses 9 through 12, I have underlined those passages of scriptures that are very important. In other words, uh, when we look at biblical text, if it is repeating something, then the repetition of it is a sign. Somebody say a sign. A sign of what God wants us to get and to extrapolate out of the text. And so, and so I've underlined certain things that are repeated for us uh, throughout this text. Verse 9, it says this, after he has talked about the parable of the seed and the sower, he says this, and he said to them, he who has ears to hear, let them hear. Verse 10, but when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parable. And he said to them, to you it has been given to know, everybody say to know, to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. Hmm. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables. Hmm. So that seeing they may see and not perceive. In other words, you'll be able to see it, but you won't be able to perceive it in your spirit and get it in your heart. And in hearing, they may hear and not understand. There's that hearing again. Lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. Next slide. Uh, 13, come, come on. And he said to them, do not understand this parable. Do you not understand this parable? Listen to what he says. How then will you understand all the parables? In other words, this is the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone of all of the parables that Jesus is going to be speaking. If you do not get this parable about the kingdom, you won't be able to understand the rest of them. 
because everything with God about the kingdom of God is about hearing. Somebody say hearing. 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 He said to them, do not understand this parable. How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear. Look at that. Look, I underlined it for you. When they hear. Satan comes when? Immediately when they hear it and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. When does Satan come? Exactly. But he comes immediately after we do what? Hear. Hear. Here, here. 16. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground who when they hear the word immediately receive it with gladness. And when they receive it with gladness and they have no root in themselves and so endure only for a time. And afterward when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake. Not your sin but what you heard. Immediately they stumble. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word. And the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things entering to in ch choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But these are the ones sown on good ground, those who hear the word, accept it and bear fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. All right, next slide. Also, he said to them, verse 21, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed. <laughs> Nor has anything been kept secret but that it should come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, come on somebody, let them hear. In other words, revelation, when it does come into the heart and the mind of man, it comes off of the basis of you hearing. But the question is not necessarily whether or not you can hear. The question is whether or not you have an ear to hear. <laughs> then he said to them, verse 24, take heed what you hear. That word heed comes from the word that means be aware of, be watchful of what it is that you're hearing. In other words, just don't think that this is just another Bible study. And when you come in to hear the word on a Sunday, just don't think that it's a, just another Sunday. You got to be aware of what it is that you're hearing. Why? Because with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, come on somebody, what does that say? More will be given. In other words, you have been given things according to the measure of how you hear things. Oh, God, I'm already preaching. If, if you don't hear it right, you won't receive it. All right? And so now he says in 25, 5, For whoever has, to him more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him, Paul. What he is saying is that what you have, if you're not aware of what has already been given to you, then what you have can be taken away from you because you were never aware of what you were given. But if you become aware of what you are given, now you're able to protect it, take heed of it, be aware of what God spoke to you and how you should respond. And based off of your response to what God already said, more will be given to you. Y'all still with me? Right? Your, your next slide, your next slide. Uh, so, so, verse 33. And so, then he says, and with many such parables, he spoke the word to them. As they were able to hear it. In other words, when they get exhausted in hearing, he stops speaking. And sometimes the issue that we're having in our lives is that we're praying, God, give me something, give me a word. But the problem, the reason why he can't give you no more than what you already have is because you're exhausted. 
because you've done nothing with the word that he already gave you. And so now why should he repeatedly give you another word when you have not responded to the last word that he gave you? So sometimes the next word that God gives you is the last word he gave you. Y'all still with me? Yes. Hold on, this is going to be a ride. But without a parable, he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. Oh God, this is powerful. Which means that to the outsiders, he gave stories and parables and metaphors and similes. But to those who were walking with him, those who were close to him, he gave the mysteries of everything that he was saying, which means that there is levels to the way that God will speak to a person according to how close they are to him. <laughs> Slap somebody a half five and say, there are levels to this. There are levels to this. He will not show you everything because you may not be ready for everything on the level that you are on. He will grow you to the level that gets you ready for the next thing that he has in store for you if you are willing to hear. This is where it gets good. <laughs> 35 says, and on the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Amen. Now when they had left the multitude, because we're talking about developing by transitioning. <laughs> oh God, stay with me. I, this, we're talking about developing by transition that you'll never be able to develop if you're not able to move with what he said. <laughs> but in order for you to move by what he said, that you have got to be willing, watch, to leave the multitude. Yes, sir. In other words, you have got to be willing to leave the crowd that you have grown so accustomed to being a part of and the crowd that loves you so much just the way you are that they never push you to become everything that God is calling for you to become, which is the reason why God breaks into your crowded relationship areas and speaks a word to you about crossing over to another side. Oh, God, look at somebody and say, I'm going to another side tonight, tonight. I'm on my way to another side. Now when they left the multitude, they took him along in the boat. This is powerful. They took him along in the boat as he was. We'll talk about that later. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose. Another translation says, and a great, great windstorm developed. So while God was moving the disciples to develop them, there was a storm that was developing in front of them. So the development of storms outside of you is a sign of the development that God is placing or having on the... You don't believe me. I'll convince you by the time this is over. <laughs> And the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Listen to them talk. Sometimes you got to ask yourself what part of you is talking in the storm. Because sometimes it's not your faith talking, it's your trauma talking. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Verse 39, then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. Somebody holler out, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. 
But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? How is it, watch, that you have no faith? How is it that you have no faith, knowing that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God? We just spent a whole day been giving you the word all day. Mysteries, revelation upon revelation, truth upon truth. All day you've been with me and I've been telling you about the mysteries of the kingdom. And now when you're in the storm, you act like this. Hey, God today. You act like this. You act like you haven't heard nothing. And they feared exceedingly. And said to one another, who can this be <laughs> that even the wind and the sea obey him? Okay, all right. <laughs> I want to talk to you today about, about faith, storms, transforming faith or storms developing faith all right i want you to give three people a fist bump and then and then bc tell them tell them your storm is transforming and developing your faith tell them that You can have your seats in the presence of the Lord. All right, let's go to work. I want to introduce to you a theological concept. Well, not just a theological concept, but a concept nonetheless uh, that many people have used in areas of academics. Uh, Dr. Lynn Swede is a specialist in this particular area, uh, in the area of semiotics. Now, semiotics is just a name and a terminology that means uh, it deals with the interpretation of discourses, art, etc., according to the theory of signs. It is the study then of signs. Hermeneutics, which is a, an interpretive method that we use to interpret text is simply the theory of interpretation and that can involve semiotics, which means that when you read a particular text, you read a particular text for the signs that God has given in it. There are signs that God gives to all of us, that these signs are supposed to be signs that are supposed to move us. Uh, if you come to a stop sign, the stop sign is just so that you can stop, but it is the position of the stop sign that gives you revelation of how long you're supposed to stay there. <laughs> because a stop sign is always at an intersection that you must pass through. It is a place of transition. And the reason why we need signs is for proper and safe transition. If we stay where we are, then we won't be able to move to the places where God has in store for us. Because anybody that says that they have faith must understand that faith then is not a noun, even though we can use it as a noun to describe our, the way that we believe or our denominations and things of that nature. But really the Hebraic understanding and custom of the word is that it is a verb, which means that if you say that you have faith, but there is no action to your faith, then you have not the faith that you think that you have. You may have belief, but you don't have faith. And it's very possible for you to have belief and not have faith. Belief is the intellectual substratum of the things that you hear, uh, that you concoct within your head that you think about. Uh, but thinking about something is not necessarily doing something. Oh, God, oh, God. Uh, when God is looking at you to see whether or not you have faith, he does not look at just what you think about. He looks at what you do. 
Let me give you an example. The Bible says that there was a father that had a lunatic son, and the Bible says that he brought his son to the disciples, and the disciples could not do anything with him. Uh, Jesus, uh, James, and John is coming down out the Mount of Transfiguration. He then brings his son to Jesus to see what he could do with them. And he says, uh, Jesus, I brought my, my son to your disciples, and they can do nothing with them, but I, I'm bringing him to you uh, to see what you can do. And then Jesus says, do you believe? Because all things are, come on, possible to them that believe. He says, I do believe, but then he says, help me in my unbelief. Now, now, if you have unbelief, the Bible, the Bible even says, and people have taught this, that if you have any kind of unbelief and doubt in your heart, you may not think that you can receive anything from the Lord. Have y'all heard that before? Uh, but it is not talking about that kind of intellectual postulation. It is talking about how you respond to it. So even though the father had unbelief in his head, we know that he had faith because he still brought his son to Jesus. Jesus was not looking at the unbelief in his head. He was looking at the action of his faith. So look at your neighbor and say, you got to do something. You can't say that you believe in or have faith in what God told you and you're still sitting there on your blessed assurance doing nothing. Y'all still with me? And so when we talk about signs, we are talking about things that extrapolate, that we can extrapolate from the Word of God that are simple for us to be able to understand how God would want us to perform and how God would want us to act to activate that which we believe called faith. And so now, it is the word hearing. That word hearing, I underlined it for you, I underlined it nine times. It is nine times spoken through the text that we have heard it. That means that it is repeated nine, somebody say nine times. Nine times is the number of development, it is the number of the fruit of the Spirit. See, it, it develops, it deve it, which means that if he is saying nine times that you need to hear the Word of God, he is trying to develop something on the inside of us that cannot be ordinarily developed just by sitting still. <laughs> development occurs when there is movement. So, so when we're talking about hearing, stay with me, stay with me. This is, this is the, the lecture part. I'm just going to pin my ears back and just lecture for a minute. Um, when we're talking about hearing, we're talking about the Hebrew word shama. It is equivalent to the Greek word in that text, akuo. Uh, akuo is the same word that we get acoustics from. Okay. Now, now shama is the, uh, is the word that means to hear, but it's not just to hear, but it is to respond to that which you are hearing. It is to obey that which you are hearing. But the word hearing is, or shama, is really written in three Hebrew letters. And those three Hebrew letters are signs of the meaning of the particular word. Everybody say three Hebrew letters. The first Hebrew letter is a shin. Everybody say a shin. A shin paints the picture of teeth. The sign is the teeth. Teeth means consumption, which means that you will not be able to hear that which you are not willing to consume. In other words, what you hear has got to consume you to the place where it moves you to the next place where God has in store for you. If it doesn't consume you, you really didn't hear it. Y'all still with me? Right? So, so it, it represents consumption, passion, love. You've got to move with some kind of consumption. It, it's, it's, it's not just the word. It, it, it consumes me. The Bible says that Jeremiah was in a cistern and he was talking about, God, you, 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 you hoodwinked me. You tricked me. Uh, I did what you told me to do. And, the, and these people, these ornery people put me in a sewer. And now I'm here in a sewer because I obeyed you. And, and I want to quit you. But then the Bible says if you keep on reading that it was like fire shut up in his bones. It consumed him that even though he was in a cistern, even though he was in a bad situation, the word of God consumed him that he still had to do what God called him to do, even though it was not the best outcome that he was thinking for his life. And that is what it's like to hear God and do something that you don't like and people don't like, but it consumes you anyway. Oh, God, oh, God, have you ever been consumed by what God said? Now the second Hebrew letter is the letter Mem. Everybody say Mem. Now, Mem paints the picture of an open womb. That's the sign. 
<sighs> it's an open womb, which means that what you hear is, is, a, is God impregnating your spirit with something. And whatever he impregnates your spirit with, it first starts out as a closed womb because closed womb is development, but open womb says that you're about to give birth to something. Uh, you, you give birth to that which God has impregnated on the inside of you, which means that you've got to spend time with the word of God enough to get pregnant with what he said so that you can hear it, so that in due time, you'll be able to give birth to that which he spoke to you in your spirit. And that's what he was talking about, that whatever he speaks to you in secret eventually is going to be revealed publicly, but you've got to get secret with him. <laughs> oh, God, God, look at your neighbor and say, get secret with them, get secret with them. Yeah, 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 get secret with them, get secret with them. Now, I'm, I'm, talking, about, I'm talking about having God speak to you, and before you put it on, on, on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok, and, and before you put it in the social media atmosphere, you don't say nothing for nine months about what he spoke to you until it forms, until it's birthed on the inside of you, because then we know that you have heard it. For some of you, we don't know that you heard it because you talk too much. And how can you hear and talk at the same time? Just saying. The third Hebrew letter is very interesting. It represents a revealed knowledge of God. It's an eye and it paints the picture of an eye. The eye is the sign. It speaks of spiritual insight which means that God opens up your eye to be able to see things in your spirit that you cannot see with your eyes. <laughs> oh God, somebody say spiritual insight. It's the fact that God speaks something to you and then now you start seeing what he speaks to you. And when you open up your eyes, it don't look like what he said and don't look like what's in your head or what he said because you're looking at it through your eye. Uh, but, but when you open, when you close your physical eye and open up your spiritual eye, you start seeing what God says about you. And now you are in a whole nother place because now you're not blind to where he wants you to go. And you're not blind to what he wants you to do because you saw it in your spirit first y'all know <laughs> if you go without seeing it first in your spirit you go blind because you didn't see it first before you saw it but you've got to see it here before you see it there. You've got to see it here before you see it there. You've got to see it here before you see it there. If you never see it here then you'll never see it there. And look at your neighbor and say open up your eyes so you can see. Uh, look at your neighbor on the other side. Tell him, open up your eyes so you can see. So you can see. See. You can see. Those are signs. Teeth. Womb. Eye. Hearing. Let's go to the Greek. Greek is, is, the, is the word akoi. Akoi means, means used of inner spiritual hear, hearing that goes with receiving faith from God. In other words, I'll never be able to see it if I cannot hear it. <laughs> because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word is the sign. The word paints a picture in my spirit and my faith attaches itself to the word and now my faith starts growing based of the seed of the word that was sown in my heart. There we are. Huh. It comes from the word akuo, properly to hear, listen figuratively, to hear God's voice which prompts him to birth faith within. So everything that God wants to do in your life is happening right between your ears. <laughs> Let me say that again. Everything that God wants to do in your life is happening right between your ears. So he is getting the disciples ready to transition, but they cannot transition if they don't adequately respond to what he said. What is the last thing that he said to them before they get to the storm? Come on, come on, come on, come on, y'all ready? Come on, you're, you're, it's right on the tip of your tongue. What did, what did he say? Let us go to the other side. Oh, God. 
And there are three signs of the text that I want to highlight to us just, just so we understand oh, what, what God is doing here. There are three, three, three things I want to highlight, and then we're going to pray, and then, and then we'll let you go. Uh, 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 the first thing that I want to highlight is the wearied sleeper. See, the wearied sleeper is a sign of what God wants to do. The wearied sleeper, and I'm going to talk about the terrified disciples, then I want to talk about the acoustics of, of the word. The, the, the first thing is the wearied sleeper. Everybody say the wearied sleeper. The Bible says that when, when, by the time Jesus says that, let us go to the other side, uh, that the disciples said, fine then, we're about to go to the other side. If we, if we go to the other side, and we're going to respond to what Jesus said. But then they said something. The Bible says that the disciples took him even as he was, hmm. which means that he was wearied, but he was still the word. All right, all right, all right, all right. Oh, the, the phraseology says that it took him as he was without preparation or delay, the object being simply to get away as quickly as, as we can get away because as soon as he said, let's go to the other side, they said, let's go, let's kick it, we out of here. And then they took him as he was. Somebody say, take him as he is. Now that is the Greek word allo. Everybody say allo. Allo means another or of the same kind. In other words, I am taking him as he is, but I'm taking him and a representation of him at the same time. I'm taking the Christ that I see and the Christ that he is. Um, now the Christ that I see is tired, but the Christ that he is is not tired. Because, uh, y'all see, so I'm taking my perception of him and I'm taking the reality of him at the same time into my boat. When we are going into places where God is calling for us to go, we will always take two perceptions of Christ. We will take the Christ that he is and we will take the Christ that we perceive him to be. The problem with our perception is, it's limited by experience. Mm. So you never see him as he is, you see them only as you have experienced him, but you have not experienced all of him. So you've got a limited perspective of him so that when you're preaching and teaching him, your limited perspective of him is based off of your experience of him. And that's the reason why you sound silly talking about him. Oh, look at your neighbor and say, you don't know him like that. So now Jesus has got to come as he is and be the weary sleeper. Let you know that my flesh can be weary, but my spirit can be strong. Oh, God. Oh, God. Who, who is that for? <laughs> See, well, you got to understand that you can be weary in your flesh, but still be strong in your spirit because your humanity is weak, but your spirit man is. Slap somebody a high five and say, don't get it twisted. Tell them, I may look weary but I'm really strong. I may look tired, but I'm really strong. I may look like I'm about to give up, but I got enough strength to last this round. Oh God, don't look at thee and judge me by how I look, because underneath all this flesh, there's divinity waiting to come out of me. I'm taking, I'm taking, I'm taking two Christ with me. I'm taking Jesus who's weary and I'm taking God who never sleeps or never slumbers. Yes. And both of them are with me. The evening has come. Can I prophesy to somebody? The Bible says that the evening had come. And I told you previously that whenever the Bible is talking about evening has come, it's talking about coming into a new day. So the disciples are about to come into a new day. And coming into a new day means coming into a new revelation of who Christ is in your life. Dear God. But it never starts with the sun coming up. Sometimes it starts with the sun going. Oh God, I don't know who. I don't know who that was for, but some of you are in some dark seasons right now and you think that God has not heard you. I'm here to prophetically tell you, you have started a new day. <laughs> yes, Lord. 
Yes, Lord, touch three people and say, it's a new day for you. 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 It's not the close of your day. It's the beginning of a new one. Just because it got dark, it don't mean that God stopped deciding what he was going to do with you. He's already decided that he was going to bless you before it ever got dark. And the Spirit of God was still hovering over the faces of the deep. And it was dark and the Spirit was still moving. He's a worried Christ. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta understand the wearisome, the wearisomeness of Christ. He's, he's, he's God, but he's never been man before. <laughs> so it's new for you to know him, but it's new for him to know you. Because I've never been you before. <laughs> Uh, that's why we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He was tempted like as we are, but yet did not sin. We need a high priest who can be like us and save us and redeem us because he knows what it's like to be tired. Not because I was doing everything, but because I was doing what he was called me to do. I was doing ministry. I was working. I was serving. And I'm tired. Dear God, I don't know who I'm talking to in here today, but I want to talk to somebody who's been tired. You've been serving. You've been working. You've been preaching. You've been teaching. You've been helping out everybody in the church, everybody in your household. And you are tired. And you have become the weary. And it's time for you to go to sleep. Oh, God, I bind the spirit, oh, God, oh, God, that tries to condemn you for getting a nap in. Oh, God, oh, God that workaholic spirit that gets you always working, but you can never take a breather and never take a sleep or never take a nap and never take eight hours or seven hours. Honey, get your sleep! You gotta teach that. Teach it. Because your humanity needs rest. Can I, can I, can I go a little deeper? We see this weary Christ. He comes into the boat. He does not go to the stern of the ship, to the head. No, because he's been at the head all this time. And just because I'm not at the head don't mean I don't have the power. I could be weary and powerful. Yes. <laughs> oh, God. So instead of going to the head, he goes to the stern. The Bible says that he lays on a pillow. A pillow? What's interesting, when I, when I studied this and researched this, is that there are certain ships that fishermen would have that would have a, a, a moments or places where people would lay. And it would be a, a wooden hard place, but it would be a very thin cushion. And it would be uncomfortable to those who were not weary. But when you are exhausted, hard places are comfortable places. Oh God, when you are exhausted, hard places can be comfortable places. Come here, Jacob. Uh, Jacob is running from his brother and he is tired. He is so tired of running that he will prop up a rock. And even though the rock is a hard place, he can go to sleep in a hard place because he is so exhausted. And it's very possible for you to be exhausted and be in a hard place. And maybe God has brought you to a hard place so you can get comfortable being in a hard place. He is sleeping, the stern of a ship. What's interesting is that he has already said his word 
And now he's resting in what he said. So, 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 yeah. He spoke, let's go to the other side while he was tired. And then went on the stern of the ship and rested in what he said. My problem with the disciples is that if you see Jesus, on your ship in a storm and he's resting on what he said how come you can't rest in what not in what you say not in how you feel not in how it looks but in what set somebody a high five and say rest in what he said God, I don't know who, who I'm talking to today, but the devil's been trying to rob you of your sleep. I bet you you're going to sleep good tonight. Tonight? Hey! God, you're going to get your rest tonight, honey. You're going to stop pacing the floor tonight. Tonight is your night that God is going to give his beloved sweet. Brings me to the, to the terrified disciples. A question how can you be terrified haven't you being fishermen dealt with storms before <laughs> what is different about this storm See, you got to understand that even though that they are disciples and even though that they're still trying to develop in their faith and things of that nature, you got to also understand that, 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 that there's something about the storm that they have experienced enough storms to know that there is something different about this storm. This storm is a little bit more hellish. This storm has got me waking up concerned about stuff that I never was concerned about before. This storm is different from the last ones that I've ever experienced. Why? Because the intensity of the storm had more to do with who was on my ship. Oh, I came to prophesy to somebody. If the storm in your life is a little bit more intense right now, it's because you got a promise of a Christ that's on the inside of you and the devil don't like it. They become terrified. The winds are kicking up. In fact, in fact, Read, if you read the text, the Bible says that when they got into the ship, that a storm was developing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm talking, come on, the key word. I, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about not just the development of a disciples, but the development of the storms that they are called to go through. Yeah. I want to tell somebody that there are storms that have been cut to the continuity of your purpose and your destiny, which is the reason why you're going through it and everybody else. It is because there is a storm that's developing with your name on it. <laughs> can, I go, can I go a little deeper there? The Bible says it, it, it is a developing storm. That, that word is genomiah. And Jeremiah just simply means, it means to emerge, to become, watch, transitioning from one point to another. In other words, <laughs> the storm was created to transition you. 
<laughs> I'm trying to help. I'm trying to help somebody. It was not created to kill you. If the thing that you are worried about is that you're going to die in your storm, tell your feelings to shut up. We will not die in this storm, but we will rise up on wings as eagles. We sh- you got to get arrogant like Paul, who was in a storm too. And the Bible says that everybody was saying that we're going to die. And Paul stood up and said, all of you, everybody who is with me, you will not die because I got purpose on me. And if you stay with me, you'll stay alive. Get away from me, you may die. I can't promise. But everybody that's with me will not die in this storm. That's why I can get on a plane. And even though the plane has got turbulence, don't hear me today, I can stand up and boldly declare, I'm sorry, y'all, for your fear, but you will not die on this plane because I'm here. Okay, y'all. Y'all can't handle that kind of... Y'all, y'all can't handle that kind of arrogance. Uh, 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 you won't die because I'm here. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. I'm here, I'm here. Watch this now. I'm a sign. Okay, y'all missed it, y'all missed it. Uh, look at somebody tell them, I'm a sign. When you see me coming, I'm a sign that you're going to outlive your storm. Sign. I just, I just, they're terrified. They see water come in and they're working. They're trying to keep the water out the ship because they don't want to die in this storm. Watch the work that they're doing. They're not even doing work, they're laboring. They're laboring, trying to keep the ship afloat. But Jesus is sleeping. They're laboring. Jesus is sleeping. They're laboring. Jesus is sleeping. Jesus. They say, Jesus, carest thou not that we perish. What they were saying is, why are we doing all this laboring? trying to keep us alive and you are asleep doing nothing. What they wanted Jesus to do was to labor with them. Okay, all right. (laughs) What they wanted Jesus to do is to work with them. But Jesus, watch, (laughs) is awakened to peace. And he is asleep to his flesh. The disciples are asleep to peace, but they are awakened in their flesh. And they're trying to wake Jesus up. And Jesus is already woke. Okay, I'm trying to help somehow. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. The flesh part of me is sleep, but the God part of me is watching over my word to perform it. And they are trying to invite Jesus into their limited perception of how he should handle the storm that they are in. Jesus does not labor. (laughs) Jesus gets up. (laughs) Y'all doing too much. And he, the Bible says, speaks to the winds and the waves. (laughs) And they... Oh, babe, I want to talk about the acoustic word here. See, 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 what it tells me is that Jesus says, 
Let he that has an ear. Let him hear what I'm saying. The disciples missed what he was saying, but the winds heard him because the winds of your life got ears. All right. Uh, 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 uh. Come on, come on, somebody, come on, somebody. Look at somebody say, the winds of your life has got ears. The winds of your life is listening to what you are saying. The storm got worse because they were saying the wrong But you got to learn how to tell your feelings to shut up. Practice it right now. Tell your feelings, tell, shut up, 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 shut up. How you feel about it and how it is are two totally different things. You feel bad about it. You're afraid of it, but that's not how it is. So Jesus stands up and he says, peace, be still. I'm going to take a turn right here. I'm going to take a turn right here. When he says, peace, be still, the winds heard it. And the wind said, hold on. That's our creator. We gonna stop. Come on, come on. We gonna stop. And then he told the waves, peace, be still. You be still. Because the reason why the waves were agitated was because the winds were blowing. The reason why the scene was agitated is because the unseen was acting up. So when Jesus got ready to speak to the storm, he didn't speak to the scene first. He, come on, come on. He spoke to the unseen. It's the thing that you don't see that's causing for the waves to come into your ship. But if you don't see it the way God sees it, then you'll be speaking to the wrong thing. I got so much more to say, I got a hard time. I, I got to pray. I got to pray. Watch. Watch. When he says, let us go to the other side, what they did not know is what was on the other side. Because they were about to enter into another realm where there was demonic activity in Decapolis, Luke would say Decapolis, we call it the Gadarenes. And there was a boy that had legion on the inside of him that had a stronghold on the region. It was a spiritual, supernatural stronghold. And so spirit heard spirit. When spirit heard spirit say, let us go to the other side. The word said, side, 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 side. And that evil spirit said, what is that I'm hearing? Jesus is coming. Send a storm. I want y'all to see it. I want y'all to see it. I want y'all to see it. Where Jesus was, he says, let us go to the other side, 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 side. And over on the other side, they heard what Jesus said and sent the storm to stop them from getting to the other side. Your storm is not coming from your past. I 
I got a secret. Your storm is not coming from your past. It's coming from where you are going, your future. Suck somebody a high five and say, my future must know I'm coming. Oh God, look at somebody else telling my future must know I'm coming. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. I'm coming, I'm coming. I may be weary, but I'm coming anyway. I may be tired, but I'm... I dare you to open up your mouth and give God glory. I don't care if you're tired. Let your future know I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. I'm coming, I may be tired, but I'm coming anyway. I may be weary, but I'm coming anyway. I may be messed up, but I'm coming anyway. I may have made a mistake, but I'm coming anyway. I'm coming, I'm coming. I'm coming, I'm coming. I need somebody to praise God with them. I'm, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming. Yes! to get up and start speaking peace. Yes! Yes! Your future heard you. Your future heard your prayer. Your future heard your prophecy. Your future heard your promise. And every devil in hell is trying to get you from not getting to the other side. But the word of the Lord said, let us go to the other side, which means we gonna get there. We gonna get there. If I keep on going, we gonna get there. If I gotta crawl, we gonna get there. If I gotta roll, we gonna get there. If I gotta crawl, we gonna get there. By skateboard, by bus, by camel, by mule. We go. Yes. 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 Seconds of I'm gonna get their praise. favor grab your neighbor by the hand just one neighbor just one neighbor now I understand the reason why Jesus needed to sleep he needed to rest because of where he was going so when he got to the shore of the Gadarenes he was well rested to deal with the devil and that demon that was in the region. What the enemy wants you to do is to not be well rested when you get there. 
so he wants you to be tired by the time you get there but I decree and declare right now you will fight rest while you are in transition you will find rest 